Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I think this is the this is one in uh, over the past several years we've had briefings like this for the media to help orient uh, people to fire season and what happens during fire season. Here in the governor's office, we believe it's critically important that the public uh, is educated and has opportunities to ask questions about what fire season is like uh, here at state government and uh, give you an opportunity as members of the media and members of the public to know who we are, to put names of faces, to understand what each individual agency does uh, during the course of fire season. As you know, and as the governor has reiterated a number of times, fire seasons in Oregon have become more intense and more severe. Uh, each year of her tenure as governor has been a historic fire season with named fires uh, that have brought our office out into the field uh, to assist our agencies and to learn more um, and experience uh, what people in areas affected by fire are experiencing from Chuckle Fire to the uh, Eagle Creek Fire in recent years. The governor views it as utmost importance um, that, the, that, the, that, uh, that she is briefed and up to date on all aspects of fire season. We begin looking at fire season in January, looking at forecasts, uh, and then coordinating with our agencies uh, through the course of the spring and during the course of those coordination meetings. We've always recognized that having an opportunity like this, opportunity like this, uh, to brief the media and brief the public on how fire season is approached in our coordinated state agencies, how they coordinate with their federal and local partners, those are critically important questions. Last year's fire season cost the state general fund in excess of $13 million, I think had a total cost of over $500 million uh, and gross costs across all, um, all participating entities. So this is a significant matter. It's a matter that the governor's office takes seriously and the governor takes seriously uh, and is attentive to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I want to introduce you to the people who coordinate on the ground um, every day during fire season. And I'll start, um, well first I want to recognize all the agencies that are in the room. Not all have speaking roles. Uh, today we have Oregon Department of Forestry, Oregon Health Authority, Oregon State Fire Marshal, and Department of Environmental Quality in the room uh, available to speak. As Kate Condeshen mentioned, please hold your questions until the end so we have an opportunity to go through the presentation and then we'll be available to ask or answer any questions. Also in the room is the Oregon Military Department, Office of Emergency Management, and DPSST, and I just want to thank them for being here. Um, they're available to answer any questions, but we wanted to keep it to a tight briefing, so are not here at the table right now. Um, but thank you for being here, really appreciate it. Did I miss anybody? Great. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to Doug Graff, who is the Chief Fire Protection. Good morning, all, and thank you for being here. My name is Doug Graff. I serve as Chief of Fire Protection for Oregon Department of Forestry. The department protects approximately 16 million acres of forest and grazing lands uh, across the state, and we're uh, responsible to coordinate, uh, complete and coordinate fire protection system uh, with the state. We partner in that system. I'll speak today uh, on the outlook of fire season as we're entering uh, 2019, kind of the core area of fire season uh, this year. Also speak to statistics to date around what we've been experiencing and what we can expect uh, based on that outlook. Uh, speak to our readiness uh, for fire season and close with a prevention uh, message uh, around preventing wildfires. Uh, first of all, the outlook for this year, we are expecting a hotter and drier summer. Uh, that has been consistent uh, with previous years, consistent frankly since 2012 when we experienced drought conditions coming into southeast Oregon. Uh, we did have some reprieve uh, this year uh, with the winter. Uh, we did get a good snowpack and that has been helpful. It's receded the drought conditions really isolated back into the northwest corner of the state of Oregon. This month we're seeing those drought conditions turn a little bit with the hotter and drier conditions. We're expecting that to spread uh, back to the south and a little bit to the east uh, throughout fire season given those hotter temperatures. So overall, a little bit more favorable than what we've experienced in 17 and 18, uh, but expecting a higher than average fire season 
uh, based on those hotter temperatures, drier, and they still remaining in existing drought conditions. And I would isolate, really focus area of uh, perhaps greatest concern would be west of the Cascades, uh, uh, given those consistent uh, drought conditions. Nationally, as we look at wildfire, uh, currently we're fighting fire in Canada and Alaska, so the Northern Territories are experiencing significant fires, and we have folks supporting uh, those efforts. Uh, Washington uh, really looks like uh, much of the state will have those drought conditions, so this concerns there again to our north. Uh, California looks consistent as previous years in terms of drought conditions. Uh, Throughout the summer, we're seeing predictions for desert southwest uh, to have some challenges. And then the far southeast, uh, Alabama, Georgia, and northern Florida, uh, looks to have elevated uh, concerns as enter into fire season. So there's a national perspective. Uh, back to Oregon, as we think about uh, fire seasons and what's above normal, our 10-year average uh, at this time, we experience uh, just over 2,000 wildfires a year. Uh, they burn uh, just over 500,000 acres. To year to date on ODF protected lands, the 16 million acres that we have responsibility for, that's approximately 12 million acres of private lands and 4 million acres of public. Now we're sitting uh, close to our average in number of fires. We've experienced 240, uh, sorry, 274 fires to date, uh, burned 1,100 acres, our 10-year average uh, is closer to 200 fires at 1,600 acres burned. I think the thing uh, that jumps out to me in that messaging is the number of human-caused fires has challenged us, uh, certainly above normal, uh, close to 100 more human-caused fires than typical. And that drives back to uh, heat, uh, a week of hot temperatures in March and during May. Uh, where we experienced the Santa Ana Park fire in northwest Oregon on March 19th, which caused evacuation of 44 homes. So we've been active since March in that first heat wave. And then again in May, we experienced statewide uh, temperatures elevated where we had fires in eastern Oregon and also in southwest Oregon. So relatively active uh, across the state uh, to date, and we're entering again into the peak of fire season as we look at closer to July, August, and September tend to be our peak uh, wildfire season months. In terms of readiness, uh, the system is prepared. You hear from my uh, colleagues, uh, specifically to those jurisdictions. Uh, statewide, we're in a very good place uh, with all of our partners. Uh, ODF is hiring us 600, approximately 600 seasonals. Uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity uh, to welcome about 300 uh, New recruits uh, coming into the wild sur uh, fire service of so first and second year firefighters uh, from all the agencies, federal, state, tribal, uh, and uh, private landowners who train and ready themselves for fire season. Uh, so that's enjoyable. Uh, we are ready in the crew ranks. Uh, aviation contracts are prepared and organized. Uh, we operate approximately 30 aviation assets uh, throughout the fire season and will adjust accordingly and build from that as needed based on the, the indices. Uh, contract crews and resources, engines and tenders are uh, available. I had a meeting with those folks uh, yesterday, made a few phone calls and uh, contractors are prepared. Uh, we rely both contractors for aviation and the ground forces in a significant way in Oregon and very pleased to have those assets available uh, when the fire fire rings. Agency partners like the Department of Corrections has their fire crews uh, ready. In fact, two female crews uh, were on the Sandy Ann Park fire in March, so we trained those folks early. Uh, so it's good to see those folks working. Uh, military uh, department remains a steady hand, as always, uh, both on the aviation front and then with some proactive work through federal funds has pre-trained the ground troops uh, that we've been executing over the past several years. Uh, so those crews stand ready. Partnerships with Department of Transportation, uh, State Police, you'll hear from OSFM, uh, Parks and Rec, ODFNW, and the 300, close to 300 local fire jurisdictions, both career and volunteer, uh, stand ready uh, for this complete and coordinated fire protection system. I was impressed this spring with the rangeland associations 
and their work since 2012 uh, to evolve a system to cover the range bias that we've experienced in Southeast Oregon. Uh, so they also stand ready uh, as volunteers in this system. Regarding a prevention message, uh, I, I really stressed that additional 100 human cost bias uh, this year as we're entering into 25 2019 fire season, and that's a point of concern. Uh, the mission is clear, uh, prevention and suppression of fires, and in order for us to be successful in the prevention, it does take all order things. So please be cognizant uh, when you enter the woods and uh, behaviors in and around your homes in the wildland or urban interface where our wildlands meet our communities. Uh, ensure that you know the local jurisdictions, restrictions on burning, uh, grinding, equipment use, the three leading causes of wildfires within the state of Oregon, our backyard burning is number one. Equipment use, like mowing your lawn and tall, dry grass uh, during the afternoon peak and summer times. And then third is recreation. Uh, so those unattended uh, campfires in the woods. Those are our three leading causes. It takes all Oregonians uh, to, to be aligned on that prevention. And I would encourage you to outreach, uh, look at Keep Oregon Green's website, uh, which is our extension uh, prevention organization uh, that helps us in that regard. Uh, to close a uh, message to the firefighters, I want to thank you all for your service. Uh, remember to uh, execute your missions as we engage in wildfires in the way that you have trained all season long. Uh, and maintain uh, safety on the forefront of every uh, task that you take. Uh, and that includes agency, contract personnel, uh, volunteer fire departments, uh, structure fire departments, the wildland organizations, both federal and state. Uh, we have all trained uh, collaboratively along with the landowner partners uh, who join us at the hip now uh, when the fire bell rings uh, to keep forefront on the safety. Uh, as we engage this year. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mariana Reese Stumple and I serve as Chief Deputy State Fire Marshal. Our office is responsible for the Oregon Mutual Aid System that is part of the complete coordinated system for the protection of Oregon uh, communities, primarily in the wildland urban interface. Uh, Oregon's response model relies on the strength of our system and also the Oregon Fire Service at large. Through the Emergency Conflagration Act, the governor commits fire resources to all hazard events for the protection of Oregon communities and primarily for the response of protection of communities for wildfire. Uh, we oversee the management of that system and that includes 11,000 Oregon structural firefighters, 7,000 volunteers, 4,000 career, and 314 fire departments. As a state and as responders, we have learned much from the past two fire seasons. Um, with the amount of fire that we've seen on the landscape and the Im increased uh, mobilizations that the Oregon Fire Service has seen, this continues to change our landscape in terms of training, response, and readiness, but also the capacity um, of the Oregon Fire Service uh, as we move through the mutual aid system and our processes. Uh, to date, uh, as my colleague has indicated, our state has uh, uh, put into place many uh, different uh, exercises, trainings. I also want to highlight the work that the Oregon Structural Fire Service has done. Recently, uh, they held a metro area wildfire school of over 100 um, emergency responders in the preparedness to fight fire in Wui and the protection of Oregon communities. I'm happy to see that. In other areas around the state, Central Oregon, Southern Oregon, they have done those systems as well. Um, and we want to thank them for that work. Uh, the Oregon State Fire Marshal has uh, numerous contracts and conversations with other states um, through our partners with the Office of Emergency Management um, and the use of the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. We receive aid primarily from California and the state of Washington in our time of need, but we also are prepared to have those conversations with other western states should we need that depending on how the fire season plays out this year. Uh, in 2018, um, the Office of State Fire Marshal mobilized to 11 incidents in the state. That was our uh, largest amount of mobilizations in one year. Um, last year, all told, we had 1,113 1, 1, fire service personnel and recorded over 1,500 response hours. Again, the highest amount of response hours and mobilizations that we have seen. 
Um, of the 7,600 structures that were threatened, he lost 89 structures, 10 of those being homes. Looking towards the 2019 season, um, I would like to leave the same message that my colleague left, that we want to thank the Oregon Fire Service, all of our emergency responders, for what they've done to prepare for fire season as they uh, lean into the fire season. We have seen many local IA uh, fires and many responses to date. Um, and we expect to see more, so thank you for your work. Um, and like my uh, colleague in the prevention, we ask that the public also be aware of fire risks and obey all fire restrictions. Um, if you live in a community that is prone to fire season and fire, wildfire, please be prepared with the ready, set, go. Uh, pay attention to local law enforcement if you are in that time and be prepared, be ready, and be ready, be set, be go. Uh, and lastly, as we approach the 4th of July, please leave all fireworks um, to the professionals. If you are enjoying and recreating on public lands, please leave all fireworks at home and please enjoy a safe and 4th of, Ju 4th of July holiday. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kirsten Aird. I'm with the Oregon Health Authority Public Health Division. I'm the Senior Operations Manager for the Public Health Division. And I'm here with my agency colleagues to really speak to the Oregon Health Authority's role in wildfire season, which the word health in our agency kind of lends itself to talk about the importance of the human aspect of wildfire and the, the protection of human health, life health, and uh, the promotion of really good practice around prevention and, and what we can do. We do this in collaboration with our state agencies and our local public health authorities and local partners, including coordinated care organizations. Really want to um, emphasize the reality that we are living in with wildfire season and the opportunity and the importance to uh, be proactive in those efforts. So certainly uh, reaching out to uh, local public health authorities and the work that they're doing and our tribal partners and, and tribal health clinics as well. Uh, we rely very heavily on the Oregon Wildfire Response Protocol, which was a protocol developed across state agencies with the ones that you're seeing here this morning, uh, but also in collaboration with our local public health authorities. And our epidemiologists, our scientists are at the ready, currently monitoring our health data that we get from emergency rooms and urgent care rooms so we can track uh, in real time what's happening around human health and how our emergency systems are being accessed. Uh, also, really thinking about what are those uh, communication strategies that your local communities can be getting prepared for. How are you using the Oregon Smoke Blog, which is your readily available uh, piece of information around what's happening daily around air quality? How are you using that to create messages that might help your community members, particularly vulnerable community members, get to safe, cleaner air spaces? Um, when you're thinking about those collaborations in your local community on how you identify and work to protect our vulnerable communities, we're really thinking of young children whose lungs aren't fully developed yet and working in collaboration with preschools, camps, uh, our school programs and athletic programs, and then all across the spectrum to older adults as well and those living with chronic conditions. And so really being cognizant and aware of the protections that they may need in cleaner air spaces and access to public spaces like libraries, malls, um, and, and working um, in collaboration with entities like the Red Cross or other community organizations that can also think about providing cleaner air spaces. One of the things the Oregon Health Authority is very, very aware of is how much people suffer during wildfire season. And as somebody who myself lives with asthma, this can be a very dreaded season, and that is top of mind for us. And so we recognize that the calls to action to stay indoors and to protect yourself can be really inconvenient, uh, but we cannot stress enough the importance of following the directions from your local emergency response partners and really taking into consideration those things that you need to do to protect your health. 
And so being prepared in advance is going to be really important because not only does this take an agency um, approach to address these issues and community partners, but each of us as individuals are going to have to kind of lean in and think about what we can do to be prepared and how we can help our community members who may not have the same access to resources that we have. So in thinking about that, uh, be prepared if you are somebody who lives with a chronic disease to work with your physician around what your care plan should be in an emergency and during wildfire season. Think about your windows and doors and making sure that they're sealed and um, protected. Check your filters and your heating and air conditioning systems. Um, if you don't have a HEPA filtration system, which is one of the best um, filtration systems to kind of keep your air clean, uh, think about what uh, filters may be needed or what opportunities you can take to look at help of filtration. And then uh, you can also consider getting a portable one as well to bring into your home. And then check for cleaner air spaces. And again, look to the Oregon Smoke Blog, which is going to be your best resource every day, day in, day out, in looking at what the air quality uh, is saying in your community. And then become familiar with the air quality index and the color coding system, which I know my partners from DEQ are going to speak to a little bit more, but really knowing uh, where to go to get that information around unhealthy air or air that's going to be bad for everybody and being able to track and pay attention to that is going to be really important. And similar to my other colleagues, I can't stress enough the importance of your local public health authorities and the work that they're doing day in and day out to protect the public's health and the uh, emergency preparedness that's taking place right now. So thank you. Good morning. My name is Tom Roy. I manage the air quality monitoring program for the Department of Environmental Quality. It's an honor to be here with colleagues who work to battle and prevent wildfires and those who help educate the public about wildfire smoke. I want to thank Governor Kate Brown for making this event happen and for the support her office provides throughout wildfire season. DEQ provides air quality data through a network of permanent and seasonal monitoring stations across the state. DEQ and our partners will have at least 40 monitors operating this summer that will be linked to DEQ's Air Quality Index, or AQI. The air quality data we provide helps Oregonians make informed decisions to protect their health. As wildfire seasons get longer, the data is even more vital for helping the public make decisions about outdoor activities, such as whether to cancel, cancel an outdoor practice, move their wedding reception indoors, bike to work, or even tell whether it's okay to just work outside in the yard. The color-coded air quality index provides current air quality conditions and ranks air quality from green, which is good, to maroon, which is hazardous. For instance, orange is unhealthy for sensitive groups such as children, the elderly, pregnant women, and those with respiratory conditions. Red is unhealthy for everyone. The best sources for accurate air quality information are government-sponsored websites. So the first of those is DEQ's Air Quality Index, which there's both a website and a smartphone app that you can be found by searching for Oregon Air. And remember, uh, select the PM2.5 tab on the website for the app to get particular pollution that's related to wildfire smoke. Second is the Oregon Smoke Block, which includes temporary monitors set up by DEQ and other agencies, such as the Forest Service, to address specific wildfire events. Third is uh, US EPA's Air Now website, which can be helpful for information on neighboring states. And the fourth is the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency, AQI, which provides monitoring data for Lane County. There are other parties providing data that may be valuable, but DEQ cannot vouch for the accuracy of their information. During the 2018 wildfire season, we saw instances where other parties' data was inaccurate compared to EQs and some of our partners. So we encourage you to rely on the government-sponsored websites I mentioned earlier, such as the Oregon Smoke Blog, to get information about um, air pollution related to wildfire events. We're seeing more and more days where air quality is unhealthy for sensitive groups, sensitive groups, or worse. And we're seeing more and more areas from the foothills of the Cascades to the Columbia Gorge being impacted by unhealthy air quality for longer durations. Last year, Klamath Falls and Medford each had more than a month of air quality that was unhealthy for sensitive groups or worse. 
that is 38 and 33 days respectively during wild fire season. In Portland, where smoky days used to be unheard of, saw six, six such days. We understand these aren't just numbers. Poor air quality affects people's lives and their livelihoods. That's why DEQ works with local, state, and federal partners and representative of tribal governments throughout wildfire season to respond to severe smoke episodes. We help deploy temporary air quality monitors, issue air quality advisories in conjunction with other agencies, and provide messaging through a variety of channels, including the Orchid Smoke Blog. The number of visits to our online air quality index soars during the summer. Because of higher volume of visitors, DEQ upgraded the AQI in 2018 to make it more modern and reliable. Again, the information is also now available at your fingertips through the Oregon Air app. And we're constantly working to ensure our air monitoring network is accessible, reliable, and serves Oregonians. We understand how important air quality information is to the public, and we'll continue to work with our partners to ensure Oregonians have the information they need to protect their health and health of their loved ones. Okay.